survivor. There are some survivors here. And there's no doubt when I just survey the congregation, I don't even have to know your story. I know if you're here and you are breathing air, you have lived long enough to have been impacted and felt the sting of opposition. If you're here, you have survived something to be here. Ecclesiastes 1 and 6 says it this way. The wind blows south, then it turns north, around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. The water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. And and then look at this right here, because this kind of makes me chuckle. He said, everything is wearisome, spoken like a tired person. Everything is wearisome. When you're weary, everything is wearisome. Conversations are wearisome. The phone is wearisome. Text message is wearisome. The job is wearisome. Going to bed makes you think about being tired. That's wearisome. You sleep and never rest. Everything is wearisome beyond. He said, I don't even have words to tell you how tired I am. Everything is worrisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we're never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. And if you read on, the rest of the verses are pretty amazing. But let's skip to 14. He said, I observed everything going on under the sun. And really, it is all meaningless like chasing the wind. How many people watch the weather here? Anybody, any weather watchers? Like, they're not, not a trick question. I know y'all do. Y'all check the weather before y'all drive on I-75. Make sure y'all can make the church. You, you check the weather before you run four to make sure because four is a traffic nightmare whether there's a storm or not. Throw in a storm and all of the transplants can't drive. <laughs> Sorry, we're all transplants. Uh, there might be like four Floridians in the room. Um... We watch the weather. We keep our eye on the wind and the rain and the storms. And so this sermon is for everyone in the house who watches the winds. Because watching the wind is equivalent to trying to calculate what you can't control. I've, I've always found it unique that the weatherman is the only individual who can be wrong most of the time and keep his job. It's a pretty good job. Just predict whether you're right or you're wrong and you are guaranteed employment. And, and, and you know, I, I find it funny. I have that app on my phone that says, rain will begin here in three minutes. That is rarely right at my house. Rain will stop in 30 minutes. Don't plan your golf game around when the rain's gonna stop. Spoken from experience. Listen, watching the wind is trying to calculate what we can't control. Worrying about uncertain situations beyond our jurisdiction, that's what watching the wind is. You know, some of you here, you fight it. You're worried your kid's gonna drop out of school and they're only 18 months old. You're worried your kid won't get the scholarships to pay for the university and they're in second grade. You are worried about the future while you're living in the present. And Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6 and 34. He said, so don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will bring its own worries. And if there's never been a more truer statement right here, today's trouble is enough for today. How many have learned that today's trouble is enough? That you don't need to compound and enhance your trouble today by being worried about tomorrow. Because I have enough trouble in my present to not be vexed by what my future's going to bring. But many of us have laid awake at night calculating the wind coming tomorrow and next month. And our spirit is afflicted by what we worry might possibly happen. We watch the wind 
while we are trying to negotiate with our present and it complicates our today. The job's not gonna last. The economy's gonna fail. The house won't sell. It will be worth less money next year. I missed the window. Well, the money will run out. I don't have enough for retirement. And we complicate today worrying about tomorrow, watching the wind. So I have a question for this congregation today. What wins today? That's, that's the summation of what I'm going to bring to you. What wins today? The wind or the word? What wins? Matthew 14 is an interesting story. It says immediately after this, verse 22, Jesus insisted. Say insisted. insisted. Say forced. forced. Demanded. Demanded. The disciples to get back in the boat. You can't go with me where I'm going. Get in the boat. Get in the boat. Go to the other side of the lake. All you people I just fed with fish and loaves, go home. You go home, you go that way, I'm going this way. I, I know what that feels like to be given an assignment and feel like I was on my own. Anybody felt that way ever? But understand, assignments always have a portion of adversity mixed within them. So can you be trusted to finish the assignment when it's difficult? Can you be counted on to finish what you've been asked to do when you feel dismissed? Does the wind make you whine? When the wind blows, do you bow out? Because if you quit before the assignment is finished, you'll never know the satisfaction of finishing what God has asked you to begin. God chose you for this assignment. He sent the others home and he chose the 12 and said, you go to the other side. Can you carry on in the middle of the storm? And so the challenge is not believing that you will meet Jesus on the other side. The challenge is enduring, pushing through. But may I remind someone, you're not alone. It only feels like you are alone. And we have to remember, you can't trust your feelings. The scripture said when the evening came, he was on the mountain alone in prayer. And the boat below on the sea was buffeted by the waves. So you know why you came to church today? It wasn't simply just to worship. It wasn't to interact socially with other people in the house. And it wasn't to perhaps try a new church. This was it. You're here today to determine what wins in your life. What wins? Who wins? The calling God put on your life or the circumstances that contradict your purpose? What wins? Your faith or your fear? What wins? The wind or the word? What wins? You or the circumstances? What wins? You or the fear? What wins? wins your relationship or the fear that's been tormenting you in the relationship what wins your belief in you or what you can see externally what wins the wind or the word the wind is against the boat and understand the boat in this story does not represent disobedience not like it did for Jonah not when he was running and going away from God this boat is obedience. This boat represents faithfulness. This boat represents assignment. He insisted, get in the boat and go to the other side. So the first thing you have to understand about assignments from God is he will send you into storms. That assignments are not easy. Assignments contain adversity. They were led into a storm. And the beautiful thing is this. I know we fixate on the rest of this miracle. And we fixate on, on the, the, the winds and the waves. And walking on the water. And all the things we will discuss. But one of the greatest parts of this miracle to me. Is that when they are faced with a storm. They don't 
quit. They don't run. Can you fight the wind when it's blowing against your progress? Can you keep pressing on when you feel pushed off track? When you don't feel God is aware of your predicament, can you finish the assignment? And and, and I'll be honest, we are raising a generation of quitters. The 9 a.m. didn't get that statement. I'll just share it with you. We are raising a generation of people who don't know how to finish. They give up on marriage. They give up on their church. They give up on their ministry. They give up on their calling. They give up on their careers. They chase money and go to different places without loyalty. Hear me. We are raising people that move with the wind. But if you're going to do God's purpose in your life, the wind can't get you off course. And I'm frightened if we don't teach this individuals how to deal with the disease of not finishing. They will never know the satisfaction if I fought a good fight, I kept the faith, and I finished my course. I want to finish my course. There are all kinds of storms that we confront. Health storms and physical storms and financial storms. Emotional storms. Storms of every kind and every imaginable wind. But hear me clearly. The presence of the storm does not indicate the absence of God. And you need to learn it and you need to put it deep in your spirit. You might feel alone and the storm may be raging and your faith may be assaulted. But it does not indicate the absence of God. Sometimes your assignment requires the solitude and the confidence necessary to know. I can row my way through it. I can sail my way through it. And even when he's not here, I'm still on track to my purpose. It is an intentional separation that Jesus Christ initiates. He separates himself from his disciple intentionally and sends them into a storm understanding that if they remain faithful, there will be a dimension of his revelation they didn't get before. There are all kinds of storms, secret storms. No one even knows you're in a storm because you put on your church face. You come to the house of God and you do your best to walk through and you and your wife fight all the way to church. You walk in here and go, praise the Lord, good to see you. They don't know about your storms. No one knows. But even when you feel alone and there is no encouragement in the boat you're in, you are not alone. But if you watch the wind, you'll never finish the assignment. If you watch the wind, you will stay in the safe harbor of complacency. You will live a life of ordinary ritual religiously if you watch the wind. If the disciples would have had the weather app, they would have never gotten in the boat They would say, Jesus, the time's inconvenient. This is a bad time. The crossing won't be well. It it will not be comfortable. You know, I'll just be honest with you. Sometimes you know too much. And sometimes you overthink things. And overthinking is an enemy of trust. When you overthink, you won't move in faith. I'm going to hurt your feelings. But if you're a chronic overthinker, you're a wind watcher. If you overthink everything chronically, you will not walk in faith because you will be more fixated on the wind than you are on faith. I might get a flat tire. I better not go down that road. I, my, my father, I, my father was awesome, but my father could suck the joy out of a Friday night. Because I would say, Dad, I need 20 bucks. Now, 20 bucks would fill up your car with gas and buy something to eat running out with friends. So that's a whole different world I lived in, okay? I'd say, Dad, I need 20 bucks. And he'd go, where are you going? i go, I'm going to go downtown Dallas and run around a little bit. He'd go, you know how much it costs to drive your car? Not only is it 
the gas you put in there. And he had this, my dad had perpetually had this little spiral notebook of, or a black one that folded open with white pages is about three by three. And he kept it here with a pen and he would pull it out and it was just filled with numbers and initials. So you couldn't figure out his code, but he had all these numbers in there and he'd go, the wear and tear on your car, the much, how much you pay per payment on your car, the mileage it gets, the tires, the oil change, and the gas. He'd go, it costs you this much per mile. Then you're going to run down there and spend it. And I go, never mind. I'll get it from mom. <laughs> because he watched the wind. He factored in the wear and tear on my tires. Who does that? Chronic overthinkers do that. Wind watchers do that. He calculated the mileage and the cost of gasoline in my car and the cost of my oil changes and he broke it down by how many, I'm not exaggerating, how many miles I drove. I would buy a new pair of shoes and scuff them in the driveway before I went in with my own money because he would calculate, yeah, you got seven pairs of shoes in your closet. Son, what do you need another pair of shoes for? I would hide them in the trunk of my car. He'd go, because I wasn't allowed to lie. He'd say, when'd you buy them? i go, I've had them for weeks. Well, I did. I just left the new stuff in the trunk. <laughs> you think he's crazy. No, he was a wind watcher. He calculated everything. And every decision he made was detailed, had data behind it. But that data and that chronic overthinking made him hesitant and fearful and worrisome and vexed and decisions became cumbersome and it was hard to move and it was hard to say yes. If you watch the wind, you'll never get in the boat. If you watch the wind, you'll never walk to this altar. If you watch the wind, I, 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 they've been doing a lot of construction on I-75. I don't, I, and they're working on Fowler. It's so hard to get in and out of the church. Maybe, you know, when they get done with construction, we'll go. There's a storm coming. I don't know if I should I take this job or not. I, I don't know if I should connect with this person or not. Overthinking will cause you to miss opportunities. Overthinking will cause you to miss faith. Over. Thinking will cause you to run from the assignment and you will stay in the safety of the harbor when God's calling you into revelation of his divine nature. And we buy into this notion that if God is really with us, there would be no storm. Just let me correct you right now. There are storms when you serve God. If God were really with us, we'd be happy. If God were really with us, everything would go smoothly. If God was really with me, my bills would be paid. I give it to church, my bills should be paid. If God was really with me, how could I be in foreclosure? If God was really with me, how could I have this terrible diagnosis of a disease? 2 Corinthians 4 and 8 says it this way. We are pressed on every side. I love the scripture. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. I want someone to hear me and let it be a faith declaration about who you are. We're pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. You have to make a decision that your mind will not entertain despair and depression. Yeah, you might be perplexed and have all kind of questions, but you won't quit. We're hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. The scripture said the righteous may fall seven times, but they get back up. The mark of a faithful person is that when you get knocked down, you understand it's not over and my battle is in front of me, not behind me, and you get back up. You might be pressed, you not crushed, you might be perplexed, but you are not driven to despair. Hunted down, but not abandoned, knocked down, but not destroyed. Job said, I can't figure it out. Where is God? 
How could all this happen and God be with me? How could my house be on fire and God be with me? How could the whirlwind take my children and God be with me? How could I lose all of my assets and God be with me? I looked for him on the right and I didn't see him. I looked for him on the left. I looked behind and he wasn't there. I couldn't find me. I looked in front of him. I couldn't find. Listen, the storm will reduce your visibility. And the more ferocious the storm, the less the distance you can see in front of you or around you. That's why you don't walk by sight. You walk by faith. Because if you fixate on walking by sight, listen, don't look or expect God to be clearly visible in your storm. Because how you sense God is through your human senses. You feel, you see, you hear, and and understand. If you can only sense God through your human senses, your senses will lie to you. They will tell you false realities. They will manipulate you. Senses add to your comfort and storms are never comfortable they're not meant to be comfortable but we wrestle the idea that the storm is meant to have some silver lining the cloud has some beauty inside of it some storms have nothing beautiful about them but I will remind someone the presence of the storm does not negate the presence of God The presence of the storm does not negate the presence of God. Listen, nor does it indicate the absence of God. Because if you really want to see God do his best work, get in some trouble. If you really want to see God close to you, get in chaos. God, does God do his best work when we're dancing? Does God do his best work when you're shouting? When you're praying, when we're gathered together in the community of believers, and most certainly we have interactions with his goodness and his deity and his presence, but God's best work is done in trouble. God does visit your praise. Psalms 22 and 3 said, thou inhabitest the praises of Israel. But if you want to know where God lives, God lives in trouble. Psalms 22 and 3, or excuse me, Psalms 9 and 9. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed what a refuge in times of trouble you're in good company when you're in trouble Psalms 27 and 5 for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion the secret of his tabernacles shall he hide me he shall set me upon a rock because God is present in trouble Psalm 32 and 7 thou art my hiding place thou preserve me from trouble you can pass me about with songs of deliverance Selah Psalms 37 and 9 but the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord he is their strength in times of trouble some of you have experienced this you will never feel God closer or more real or more impacting than when you are in a storm. Psalm 37 and 39, we can go on. But the Lord, look at this, but the power, excuse me, the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. Watch this one, 59 and 16. But I will sing of thy power. Yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning, for thou hast been my defense and my refuge in the day of my trouble. You are not alone. The storm will not dislocate you, discombobulate you, or destroy you. 86 and 7 of Psalms. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon thee, and thou wilt answer me. Why didn't somebody do it right now? If you're in a storm, raise those hands and say, all right, God, you said you'd answer. I'm leaning into you. Psalms 107, 13. Then the Lord, they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. You are not alone. The presence of the storm does not invalidate the reality of your God. The presence of the storm does not indicate the absence, the ambivalence of your God. Psalms 46 and 1. God is our refuge and strength. God is our refuge and strength. Always ready. Somebody say always ready. Always ready. Don't got to get ready. Don't got to decide. Don't got to weigh the options of whether to help you or not. He is always ready. He is always ready to help you in times of trouble. 
Mm. Man, I could preach a whole sermon right there. Always ready. He don't have to get ready. I don't have to validate my goodness. I don't get good to get God. I get God so I can survive. Understand very clearly. God doesn't have to look at my life and go, well, let's look at the list. Do they line up? Do they live enough? Do they have it right? Do they live right? Do they walk right? Do they talk right? Do they think right? He's just ready to help me in the storm. So I don't fear when earthquakes come, verse 2. When the mountains crumble into sea, let the oceans roar and foam and let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. I just keep believing. So if you're looking for God, turn to somebody and say, if you're looking for God, he's in the storm. Psalm 60, I just can't stop. 61 and 2, you ready? From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. I love this phrasing because I quote it often. From the end of the earth... He said, when I get to the end of my answers, when I get to the end of my intelligence, when my money runs out, when I have more questions than I have solutions, from the end of the earth will I cry unto thee, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I don't know if you're in this house and your heart's overwhelmed, there is a solution. You are not alone. Lean in to the God of your strength. He's not absent. He's with you in the storm. But, but listen to me. All of these scriptures are about God being present in our trouble, correct? Anytime God promises you something, you better get ready. Because you never promise the obvious. I, 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 I didn't go to bed last night and said, tomorrow, Deborah, when I wake up, I'll be white. <laughs> I didn't do that. Because it's obvious. I'm going to be white in the morning, but I can dance, okay? Just, and jump, okay? <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't tell her, make a promise, babe, when we get up in the morning. But what I did say, you get up in the morning, I'll still love you. And when the storms of life and the difficulties come, I'll be faithful. Because you don't promise the obvious, you promise what isn't always obvious because of the storm and the doubt that comes. You give a promise. Listen, when you know something is coming that might make you doubt. So you promise, I make this commitment to you. I make a vow to you in sickness and in health. In richer and in poorer. Some people aren't wanting to say that in their vows anymore. I got news for you. If you're getting married, there will be poor moments. Say it whether you want to say it or not, but you will run out of finances and you will run out of answers. Everybody's nodding. If, if the married people want to say amen, it's appropriate right now. How many have had a few poor moments? How many have had a few moments when you had more bills than you had funds? How many didn't know where the next answer was? Some of y'all got both hands up back there. <laughs> That's funny. Sorry y'all got me laughing. They had each other's both hands up, you know. Because there will be moments when it runs out. But I make you a promise. If you're sick, I'm there. If you're healthy, I'm there. If you're rich, I'm there. And if you're poor, I'm there. Huh? In sickness and in health. In rich and in poor. What's the rest of it? Is there any more? <laughs> Till death do his part. For better. That was the one I was looking for. For better. Yeah, you're fixing to say it. Like, you better learn that stuff. You're fixing to say it in like four or five months. You better learn it. For better or for worse. There's going to be some worse days. And some worser days than the worst days. And there's going to be some days that are the worstest days you ever thought. And it's just because you tripped over the kids' legal blocks and broke your foot. But it feels so much more worse than the days before. That's why you promise. Because you promise, because you know there are days coming that won't live up to the expectation. So you make a promise because you know there's moments coming that will make 
others doubt. So you say, I'm committed to you, to the long haul, better or worse, sickness and health, richer or poorer. I will be beside you in the night and in the day, at the sunrise and the sunset. But you don't promise the obvious. You promise the things that are not obvious. If, if, if I write a check, it's a promise. You can't spend my check. You can't take my check to the store and buy goods with it. But if you take it to the bank and cash it, there's money behind it. When God promises you something, well, I feel the spirit trying to tell someone something right now. You may not have it in your sensual realm, in the realm you can see, you can hear, you can touch, you can feel. Listen, listen. But you have it in the realm of the Spirit as a promise. He promised you, I will be with you through thick and thin. I will be with you low and to the ends of the earth. David said, if I make my bed in hell, he's there. If I ascend into the heavens, if I go to the beginning of the day and I go to the end of the night, no matter where I am, he is with me. Understand. He said, cast all your cares upon him for he careth for you. You are not alone. He made you a promise. No matter what you go through, he will be present. But he didn't promise you because it was going to be easy. He didn't promise you because it was going to be obvious. He didn't promise you because it was going to be stormless and a cakewalk. He promised you that when the wind blows and the lightning flashes, he would be present. You may not feel him. You may not see him. You may not sense him. But he's there. So don't allow the awareness of the storm to cause you to lose the awareness of God. Don't allow the ferocity of the storm to manipulate your faith in your God. Lean into the reality of who he is. So in the middle of the night, the, the darkest hour, watch what happens. Jesus doesn't come in the early parts of the night. He doesn't come in the mid. He comes in the early morning hours when it's darkest, when it's most difficult. And, and, and what I like about it is it says he came in the third watch. I believe the third watch of the night because the Bible says Jesus is on the mountain. He's aware of the storm on the sea. He has insisted his disciples go into the sea. Listen, but just because the storm is raging doesn't mean God has left the scene. Doesn't mean God is unaware of what's going on in your life. Just because he stopped the storm doesn't mean he doesn't see the storm. Just because he hasn't stopped the storm doesn't mean he doesn't see the storm. And just because someone else started the storm doesn't mean God isn't aware of your storm. And just because you don't know how long the storm will last doesn't mean God isn't intimately involved in the process of your storm. So I'm asking, is there a survivor in the house? Is there someone who will lean into the awareness of God and trust his process? So, so Jesus, and we'll go fast here, Jesus walks over the waves, defying the wind and the waves because God's eye is on you. And your life, no matter where you are or what you're going through, is not beyond redemption. So, so think about it. It's the last watch of the night. It's the darkest hours. And the Lord has let them labor in their own efforts for the first two watches of the night. Jesus went out to them walking on the water and, and, and the scripture says they saw him walking and they thought he was a ghost. So their initial response to Jesus drawing near was fear. They did not feel peace when Jesus walked near them. They felt fear. Is it a ghost? Is it Jesus? Is, is it a ghost? But in fact, they don't even think it's Jesus. It says, and they thought it was a ghost. They cried out for fear. And, 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 and I don't have time to talk about it, but his handpicked ministry is crying out like little girls because they think it's a ghost because they're immediately reverting back to superstitious belief systems. Yeah, it's a ghost! I mean, how do you go from assignment to the other side to thinking it's a ghost? I'll tell you how, just like you and I do. We're on assignment to do something from God and one bad diagnosis. Ah! And we catastrophize. And we get overstimulated. And we get terrified. 
You see, the challenge is trusting God in the uncertainty of the storm. The disciples, I'm sure they've gone through the motions mentally. Why are we in the storm? Why did he put us here? What's happening? And then Jesus comes walking to them and notice something supernatural. It's, it's, it's so cool. The Bible says, it, it, you can go find it. It's Matthew 14. I didn't give you that. But just go in there to the, the previous, the, the, the following verses. The Bible says that they are toiling, they are fighting the waves. The ship is bantered about, it's pushed about, it's pressed. But they're not scared till Jesus shows up. That is so odd. That until Jesus shows up, they're not even afraid. But when he steps into the situation, they're terrified. So hear me really closely right now. When you are at your most frightened, he is at his closest. When you are most overwhelmed, he is nearest to you. When the night is darkest, he is in proximity to you closest. And it's something I want everyone in this house to understand. When my heart is overwhelmed, Lead me to the rock. When your heart is hurting the most, when your spirit is the loneliest, when your mind is under the most emotional torment, he is closest to you. But the problem is you're watching the wind so you see a ghost and not who he is. But you know what he does? He doesn't rebuke them. He, he, he doesn't denounce them. He, he says this. Listen, Jesus says, be not Afraid, He hears their cries for fear over the voice of the wind. And he says this, be not afraid, it is I. Whatever you're hearing in the middle of your storm, if it's not be not afraid, it is I. It's not the voice of Jesus Christ. If all the other things, it's just the noise of the wind. It's, it's the chaos huh? and, and all the confusion that's surrounding the storm that you're in. But what Jesus speaks, and I have scripture for it, Matthew 8 and Matthew 14, every storm. He says in the first, why are you afraid? Peace be still. He says in the second, be not afraid, it is I. So understand uh, he is revealing his identity but they cannot see him because they have their eyes on the wind they're watching the effect of the storm so don't be moved don't be manipulated by your exhausted emotions because when you get tired you cannot trust how you feel they think it's a ghost because they've been laboring all night in a storm and when your emotions are exhausted, here, pastor, they will send you false signals. It will make you think you can't trust who you're supposed to trust. It will make you hate people who love you. It'll make you lash out at people who are trying to help you because you have an exhaustion emotionally. And when you get tired... When you get emotionally exhausted, your perception of reality is altered with emotional exhaustion. When you get tired, you'll be scared when safety is on the way. Do you see the picture? Because they're, we're watching the wind. They think he's a ghost, but their salvation is nearer than when they first believed. Because when you get tired, you'll be scared when you're meant to be safe. When you get tired, you'll stick in the familiar and miss the fact that you can walk on the water. Why is it only one who says, if it's really you, bid me to come to thee on the water? Why not a group water walking experiment? Because those who were fearful were holding on to what was familiar and they couldn't move in faith. But only Simon Peter says, look, if it's really you, give me a word. Listen, because when, if you're too tired, if you're spiritually tired, if, let, me tell, let me tell you something. You are only as healthy spiritually as you are healthy physically. This is why Satan fights your body. This is why Satan fights your mind. This is why Satan sends storms. Because if he can get you confused physically, if he can get you fixated on the winds of disease and diagnoses and fear and confusion, you will not operate in faith spiritually. You won't get out of the boat and walk on the water and do what no other human being had ever done except Simon Peter. But if you're too afraid, you will stay in the boat. If you're fixated on the weather, you will never walk. You will only ride. If you're fixated on the weather, 
you will just ride in the boat while somebody else rows. If you fixate on the weather, it will push you into fear and apprehension. It will push you into a hesitancy of service and kingdom mindedness. And you will get in a survival mode that says, I just got to outlast. Somehow I got to do this. You'll pull your mercy and your love and your grace, your hope, your faith. Because exhausted emotions will make you paranoid. You will see ghosts where it's Jesus. Exhausted emotions will make you fearful. Exhausted emotions will take the pleasure out of winning. If I ever get this house paid for, then we'll dance. If I ever get these kids raised, then I'll get my life back. If I ever get these credit cards paid off, then I'm going to give God praise and shout the victory. If I ever get past this diagnosis, I'm going to go out and celebrate and live life like I got a second chance. How about live now? If I survive this storm, I'm going to tell everybody my testimony. Is it a greater miracle for God to stop the storm or for him to give you the perseverance and strength to survive the storm? What's a greater miracle? The sensation of the winds and the waves or you walking on top of the winds and the waves? What's a greater miracle? To be empowered to move over the storm or for God to stop the storm? And, and, and I would tell you, I celebrate it when someone says, whoa, I had a bad diagnosis and, and, and the church prayed and it was gone. But I also celebrate when someone said, I had a bad diagnosis, but I just kept praying. I didn't get a healing, but I just kept coming to church. I just kept giving. I just just kept moving and they survived the storm by the fortitude of their faith. Whew. Statistically, that a tremendous amount of marriages when they go through cataclysmic incidents fall apart after they survive. You know why? Compassion fatigue. They're tired. They wore out. They gave up. We made it, but I was so exhausted. We made it, but I have no more prayer. I have no more shout. We made it, but I have no more step in my walk. We made it, but I just can't keep moving on. Huh? You see, if I could only succeed today, then I could shout. If I could only have victory today, then I could have a happy spirit. If I could only have all of my prayers answered, then I could walk in victory. No, friend, listen very clearly. God is never closer to you than when you're in the darkest hour of your storm. Embrace the journey. Embrace, embrace the assignment and understand he is closest to you when it is most dark and most difficult listen Jesus is nearest when the night is darkest so Jesus speaks one word to Simon come that's it just come not come and I'll hold your hand not come and I won't let you drown not step out and I'll be the substance upon which you walk. One word, come. That's what you say to your pets. Come. And they trust the master. You, you demand them to come when you call. You train them to come when you call. Come and they come. And some of our pets trust us more than, they, than we trust Jesus. Come. Well... Stormy, come. Well, the winds and the waves haven't stopped. Come, well, well, it's lightning out. Come, well, if there's a lot of risk involved. One word, and let me make it plain. Simon Peter never walks on the water. He walks on the word. And God wants to give someone a word from him that would give you the power to walk through the storm you're in right now and that what would pull you under, you would walk on top of it. That's what the Spirit wants to do right now, today. Peter got out of the boat and walked on the word. Is there anyone in here who believes that one word from God can enable you to walk on top of what you normally would sink in? what you normally would drown in. Peter is walking on the word, but he's still walking against the wind. And he makes a crucial mistake 
Because you can have a word from God, listen close. You can have a word from God, but get your eyes on the wind and you will sink. So the word of God will only stabilize you if you keep your focus on him. See, we think you get a word from God and this is what happens with Simon Peter. You ready? In the first storm, when Jesus speaks in Matthew 8, the winds and the waves laid themselves prostrate with one word, peace, be still. And with that word peace, it shot across the heavenlies. Be still and the winds and the waves obeyed. So he labors, and so do we often, under the danger of expectations. And we say, well, I assume when God speaks, my life's gonna be normalized and there will be no more trials and troubles and storms. So we anticipate a word from God, but when the word from God is spoken and we don't get what we expect, we falter and that's what Simon Peter does. He steps out on the word and begins to walk. But as he's walking, he realizes the word didn't change the circumstance. And because the circumstance is still windy and difficult, he started sinking because he took his eyes off of Christ. The scripture specifically said he looked from Christ and looked at the wind. And when he looked at the wind, he sank. So I'm telling someone in this house, you can have a word, but have the wrong focus and you will still drown. But the beautiful part is this, you ready? We don't know the details. We don't know how far Jesus is away, but I know this, he's gotta be farther than that because he's walking and you could have seen him. He's far enough away that his figure is shrouded by the effects of the storm and they can't see clearly. They're not really sure who it is. And Simon Peter in an act of mix, probably with a little curiosity and boldness and fear steps out and begins to walk. But when he realizes the storm hasn't stopped, when he sees the wind, he immediately begins to sink. And as he's sinking, the scripture said, Jesus took him by the hand and raised him up. I'm telling someone in this house, it's very simple. You might be in a storm, but listen, Jesus shows something of himself and I, and I gotta finish, but it's so amazing. When this happens, he takes him by the hand, they walk back to the boat and the Bible says when Jesus stepped into the boat, immediately the storm stopped. Without a word to nature, the storm stopped. But in the first storm, the scripture said that the, they watched him say, peace be still. And the disciples said, what manner of man is this that the winds and the waves obey him? In the second storm, they said, surely, they fell on their knees, surely this is the son of God. What happened in the second storm was pivotal to the revelation of what God was trying to show him, them about the nature of Jesus Christ. It's not just a man that can do miraculous things. It is the son of God and their perspective immediately is shifted and they see something about him they have never seen instantly. Could it be that where you are right now is meant to open your eyes to the nature of God in ways you have never comprehended. But you have to understand, the storm doesn't indicate his absence. It doesn't negate his awareness. Your exhausted emotions will lie to you and tell you that it's not real, that it's not substantive, that it's not for you, that there's nothing to learn, that God can't show up, but you have to cancel the lies and you have to put your faith in the word. I, I kind of believe that some of you just simply need a word in your storm right now. Some of you have a word and you need to get your eyes off the wind and get it back to the word. Others, you just need a word from the Lord today. Stand to your feet. Tampa Life, just keep talking to the Lord right now. <laughs>